I uh, appreciate uh, having the opportunity to be with everyone here today. And as Steve had mentioned and Craig has mentioned, um, I certainly my claim to fame here is that I actually was at the University of Virginia when we started to design the Dias Fat trial. So probably have worked on this longer than most. Um, we were very excited when that product got approved because it really changed a lot of people's lives in terms of being able to take care of their loved ones at home instead of going to the ER or just suffering through things. And today it's a pleasure to be able to talk about now the diazepam nasal spray Valtoco, which really takes epilepsy care to the next level which I know can be another game changer for all of you in your lives as you try to help and support your loved ones who may have cluster seizures. So with that, we'll get started. As Steve said, please ask any questions as we go along. I'll check in with Steve if there's anything specific about something I'm presenting that we need to stop and clarify a little bit more because this is intended to be conversational and informative for all of you. So as you may know, um, Valtoco was approved recently and it's used for the short-term treatment of seizure clusters. There are many people that you know may refer to it as acute repetitive seizures, flurry seizures, etc. in individuals who are six years of age and older it does fall into that class of controlled substance as a uh, C4 drug, very much like diastat was. Um, so again, you know, all the precautions associated with that are in place just like you did with diastat. We have not studied it under the age of six, so really the safety and efficacy for any child under six is not known at this part. When we think about uh, seizure clusters, I think it's important to just step back. I, I gotta believe all of you on the phone today are very familiar with seizure clusters. Probably a number of the people you care about have seizure clusters. Um, but I think when you really look at the population of individuals in, in the United States who have active you know, epilepsy, what you find is about 5% of them will have seizure clusters, which is approximately 170,000 individuals. But the most remarkable thing that I hope gets changed over you know, the next few months and years to come is that we can improve the number of people who really have a rescue therapy in their hands to treat seizure clusters. Because right now, only 20% of individuals are taking um, the medications that they were prescribed in response to a seizure cluster. So hopefully together we can all change that. So when you think about seizure clusters, I'm sure that you have your own personal uh, labels for these. Some people refer to them as back-to-back -back seizures, one seizure right after another. But in terms of what is a medical or clinical definition of a seizure cluster that your HCP, your healthcare providers might use, and that is they're looking for multiple seizures, which are two or more, that occur in a short period of time, so that's less than or equal to 24 hours or a day, that are different from the typical seizures or seizure pattern that someone might have. And that there is some recovery in between these seizures. Uh, so it's really, really important for you and your healthcare providers to kind of sit down and make sure, especially you, that they understand what you're seeing because you are an expert in what you see in your child or your loved one or you know whoever else in your family may be experiencing these cluster seizures. So being able to distinguish that from 
what they typically have is a single seizure is really important. And I can tell you from the clinical trials, when we did these, I would spend so much time with the parents um, or the loved one who might be an adult um, talking about what does this look like? Describe it to me. Because of course, at that time, we didn't have iPhones and could take videos or anything like that. So we really had to really spend the time to articulate this on pen and paper, which I'm sure today is very important for you too. When you look at like, okay, when do seizure clusters typically occur? Well, there was a review of the database of seizure calendars, and they looked at data from 28,000 patients who had experienced seizure clusters. And what they did confirm um, is that they can occur over a 24-hour period. But what you see is that you know, there's a high propensity or high likelihood that they're going to occur anywhere from six to 24 hours. I mean, you did see patients who had them, you know, certainly at every hour in that 24 hour period, but the majority of the people really saw them by six or 24 hours. So uh, I hope that helps put in context, you know, when seizure clusters may occur, but again, a 24 hour period can be a very long period. If you're, you know, the one caring for a loved one and trying to ascertain in your mind, like, is this over with yet? Or is this gonna keep continuing or whatever? Um, so I know that can be a burden for you as you think about caring for someone or asking someone else to care for someone. So let's think about how it's to manage seizure clusters. And again, you know, this is really important as you communicate with other folks. Historically, I know, and we've talked about it already, that rectal gel diazepam was really the only viable option out there for the last 20 years. And while it has its place, there are some uh, issues associated with using a rectal medication. One is, you know, the social objections of, can you administer it in a more public place? How do older children and adults feel about that? And because the route of administration, um, there was more variable uh, absorption of the product at time based on, you know, whether the patient had just had a bowel movement or was about to have one or whatever. So, you know, that creates its own challenges. There have been historically healthcare providers who have also prescribed oral tablets or wafers, which are not indicated for use in cluster seizures, but we do know that they have been prescribed because they haven't been tested and really don't know um, how they will respond for an individual patient. There's an unpredictability to how they're going to be absorbed and how effective they're going to be. The other challenge I think you'll all relate to is that if someone's actively seizing, it's difficult to administer a product that has to be put in the mouth because you do run the risk of aspiration. And then finally, I think the, the way before the rectal gel was available is that people were treated with either IV or an injection into a muscle to try to stop uh, the seizures. And that's not always convenient because that means either going to an urgent care or an emergency setting for that. We've talked a little bit about this, that it's really important to have individualized treatment plans. And I know you all on the phone here live with this every single day, but really sitting down and taking that time to establish a good history with your healthcare provider of, you know, what does the clusters look like? And in your cases, you may have someone who has more than one type of cluster. 
so identifying each type of cluster that they might experience and then making sure that there really is a common understanding both with you and the healthcare professional on what to treat, when to treat, and how to treat it, because you're going to need to share that information with others that may need to help during a cluster seizure. So really helping to sort those things out clearly can be very, very helpful. And then what to monitor after treatment, you know, what's the level of breathing, consciousness, and what kind of seizure control did this derive for the person? Also to know when it might be necessary to get emergency intervention of some kind. Um, you know, how long should you let things go on? When should you call for more help, et cetera? And then fostering, again, that collaborative relationship, not just with you and the healthcare provider, but any care partner that you're going to engage in to help support your loved one should they have a cluster. To give that person, your, you know, the individual who has the clusters and yourself time um, to do other things that you might like. So again, I can't emphasize enough, when to treat, how to treat, what to treat, what you should expect from a response, and when to get emergency assistance if necessary. Now, many of you are, I think, familiar with the Epilepsy Foundation Seizure Action Plan. And what's up here on the screen is their general seizure action plan. They also have a version specific for schools. These are all downloadable. Um, they cover, they've just been revised. So in the first page, they really cover the important information about seizures. So right up front there, it will, you know, want you to outline or describe what the seizures really look like, et cetera, um, and how someone could recognize them. Then they go into the piece here about important first aid, when to call for help, and then how to treat. So what rescue medication should you be using if the person should have a cluster seizure? And then what um, you should do if they don't respond. So these forms are now available in Spanish and Korea so that if you do have someone you're either supporting or helping or you yourself are more comfortable with having these things written in a primary language such as Spanish or Korean, they are available for you to share, not only with the people um, in your immediate environment, but anybody else who you may rely on as a care partner. One of the things we know that's really, really important here is trying to identify periods of vulnerability, like when could someone have a cluster? And can I do anything to avoid or modify the likelihood, you know, so that they don't have more seizures than what any of us would like? So, you know, lack of medication adherence is something that I think we all can relate to. You know, did a medication get missed? If you're traveling, you know, was it hard to keep up with the schedule because of different time zones, et cetera? Or did the person have another procedure where they had to withhold any liquid or medications because of that? And did that affect, you know, um, a seizure occurring unexpectedly? The other thing is sleep deprivation. And, you know, that can occur for many reasons. Also, is there some other concurrent illness going on? You know, an ear infection, a cold, a fever, whatever, uh, which can also trigger uh, seizures. And stress, I think, you know, everybody experiences stress, especially when there's changes in routines and things are not as one would expect. For our teenagers or children who are going through puberty, just be mindful that hormonal changes can really upset things and that that can serve as a trigger too, and communicate those things with your HCPs. 
I hope, you know, people don't have to worry about the consumption of alcohol, but it is something to bring to everyone's attention because alcohol cannot just be an alcoholic drink. It can exist in cough medicine and some other over-the-counter preparations. And then finally, you know, flashing lights, triggers, noise, whatever, which may be precipitating factors. And the reason to really identify some of those things is because as you, you know, invite others to be a care partner for your loved one, you want to make sure that they're aware of those things so they too can avoid them, whether it's at school, if we ever get back into the school setting, or, you know, in someone else's home. So again, you know, not can't say enough about strong partnerships. I think everybody's trying to do the very best to make sure that uh, individuals have the best care possible, that everybody knows what to do, when to do it, that these things have been well outlined, and to make sure these approaches, these treatment approaches change over time to reflect the development needs of someone, or just as they grow and their seizure changes, that these are constantly being updated. So everyone feels empowered and confident that they can do their part to help the person with epilepsy. So let's talk a little bit about Valtoco um, as a nasal delivery of diazepam. So one thing I think it's important for you to know with Valtoco is that it is, you know, again, approved for use in children six years of age and older. Uh, diazepam is a medication that we've had more than 20 years of experience for cluster seizures um, and used by non-medical care partners. That we know it is very quick and can be promptly administered with the design of the technology. That for Valtoco, it can be a customized dosing. So it's based on the individual's age and weight. Uh, so you can adjust it based on their physical needs. Um, and it provides that on-hand rescue. Um, it's discreet, you know, I, many of you may have seen it. This is the size of it. It's very small. You can fit it in your hand. Uh, it is very discreet and easy to use. And it can provide lasting treatment throughout the day, given how the molecule or the diazepam works. And it's generally safe and well tolerated. So we're going to get into this a little bit more. So um, again, it's used for acute rescue therapy. It can be used when a seizure is happening, um, right after a seizure, um, or in between seizures. So I just want to bring that out to you because, again, it gives you that flexibility of using it when it's needed and when you can get to the person that's having the cluster seizures. I do wanna call out that this is not considered a daily medication, that it should only be used in conjunction with the other daily anti-seizure, anti-epileptic drugs that the person may have been prescribed. Now there's two key components of Valtoco that I think are important for you to know about. And we've already talked about one, and that's diazepam, which is the active you know, compound in Valtoco, uh, very much like diastat. And we know that it has a relatively long half-life versus some of the other benzodiazepines. So what that means is that it keeps the blood level up to actually give you seizure control um, possible for the time of the cluster seizures. The other thing that's really nice about the product is there's a proprietary interval um, formulation that is used with the diazepam that helps facilitate the tiny vessels, blood vessels in your nasal cavity to open up and then to carry the medicine directly to the brain. So it's kind of like a little floodgate that will open, let the medication get in, 
get into the bloodstream and to the brain to do its job to stop the cluster. Now we've talked a little bit about some of these things um, and you may be familiar with the um, technology here because it is the same technology or device that's used with Narcan, uh, which I think you probably hear on the news a lot, and then also um, with a headache drug, Sumatriptan, for uh, migraine headaches. But the beauty of this is, as you can see, it's one hand delivery. You only need one hand, so you can help support the person, um, comfort them, whatever's needed. And when we say it's 360 functionality, what we're referring to is it can go up into the nose any way. It can be this way, it can be horizontal, it can be vertical, it can be on an angle. It doesn't really matter um, because it will still work the same way. What's important is that you do get the tip of it in the nose, um, just so if you try to engage it, the spray doesn't go up in the outer space here and not do its job. But there's no priming. It's readily accessible. And the nice thing about nasal delivery is it avoids what we call first pass metabolism, which means it gets to where it needs to go right away and not through the liver. Um, it can be administered by non-medical people. It's been tested and approved by the FDA for that. And what you can see here is this little compartment here is where the medication actually is. So one thing for everyone to know here about Valtoco in terms of its safety is that when we looked at what happened for the individuals who participated in the clinical trials is that the frequency of local AEs was very small, less, you know, greater than or equal to 2% of all the patients that were in the study. And what you saw was 6% had nasal discomfort, 3% had nasal congestion, 3% had a nosebleed, and 2% had some changes in taste. Now overall, at least 4% of the subjects did report some sleepiness or somnolence, and 4% did report some headaches. But there was no discontinuation related to the treatment. There were no serious you know, side effects that were considered treatment related and nothing that would have been considered life-threatening. So again, safe and tolerable. So how do you use it? Um, well, one thing I do want to call out to you that if you're allergic to diazepam, you shouldn't um, use Valtoco. Or if you have acute narrow angular glaucoma, it would not be um, something that should be used in individuals that have that. But as we talked about before, Valtoco is very individualized in its dose. So again, really trying to get the right dose based on the patient's need by age and weight. And I'm gonna talk about two different approaches. One is children six to 11 years of age where the dose that's recommended is 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. And then you can see by weight the dose strength that you might use. Um, lower weight to use the five or 10, uh, larger weights, you know, 15 or 20. And we're gonna talk a little bit more how, about the one sprayer or the two sprayers. But when a child turns 12, so equal or greater than 12 years of age, the, the recommended dosing goes to 0 0.2 milligrams per kilograms. And the reason for this is that older children don't metabolize as fast as younger children. So again, the need for the dosage um, by milligrams decreases. So you should remember that if you have a loved one, you know, somewhere between 11 and 12 years of age, you really should talk to your HCP about a dose adjustment. Or if you have, you know, a loved one who is changing their weight, you know, either gained weight, 
went through a growth spurt or have lost weight that you really want to pay attention to the, the weight so you get the right dosage at the right time, which is very, very important. The one thing I want to also call out to you is that, you know, one dose um, should hopefully do the trick, but if you needed a second dose, it can be given at least four hours after the first dose uh, to treat an episode, but no more than two doses. And the product should not be used any more frequently than every five days and no more than five episodes per month. So let's talk about the packaging here. So five milligram is one sprayer, 10 milligrams is one sprayer, 15 and 20 milligrams are two sprayers. And the reason here is that in a 15 milligram dosage, each sprayer has 7.5 milligrams. In a 20 milligram, each sprayer has 10 milligrams. And the way this comes in a box is there will be two blister packs. So it's you know two of these or two of these in a box. And one bis blister pack is a complete dose. So again, for the 15, it's the two sprayers. For the 20, it's the two sprayers. For the five and the 10, it's one sprayer. So with each box, there's two complete doses. So again, we've talked a lot about the weight, the age, and how to make sure you're paying attention to that so the person gets the right dose. But let's walk through, if you have someone who gets a five or 10 milligram dose, what you do is you get your blister pack, you open it up, you take the sprayer out, you put it up the nose. Again, it doesn't have to be all the way up the nose, just the tip, and you engage the plunger and it will spray up into the nose. You know, you discard it, you're done. If it's the 15 or 20 milligram dose, you're going to have in your blister pack too. So what you do with this is you give one sprayer in one nostril, and then you give the second sprayer in the second nostril, okay? So then you get a complete dose for the 15 and 20 milligram. So people will ask, you know, um, well, how does this work? Like, does the person have to participate? How, you know, what, what do I do? Um, can I give it when they're having a seizure or whatever? So the person doesn't have to participate at all. Uh, you can give it, you know, without them having to breathe in. You can give it during a seizure, in between seizures, after a seizure, whatever works best. But always remember that if a person is having a seizure and they've lost uh, body control, you want to get them into a safe place first. So that may be lying them down on their side or their back, you know, getting them out of a chair. If they can maintain posture, you can administer the medicine with the person, um, you know, sitting up in any position that works. And I'm gonna stop there. Steve, were there any questions about that? Because I know this can be a little tricky for folks. Uh, no, no questions have come up so far, Nancy. Uh, you know, just some stuff on the seizure action plans that um, Tracy posted up and, and people having that, but. Well, we'll keep going, but we can go back. So I'm gonna turn this over now to Enrique, who's gonna walk you through the important safety information. Thanks, Nancy. So I'm Enrique Carasana, as Steve mentioned. I'm the Chief Medical Officer uh, for Norellis. Um, my connection to the seizure cluster space, like Nancy, been working quite a while in not only epilepsy as an epileptologist for the past 30 years, but for the past decades I've been working uh, to trying to develop um, an intranasal diazepam uh, to address the unmet medical need in patients with seizure clusters. And uh, quite um, proud of the team uh, that achieved the approval of Valtoco. So my, my task in the presentation is to cover the important safety information uh, the next four or five slides are uh, dense in terms of information. So what I wanna do is I wanna refer the, the viewer and the listener to www.baltoco.com, 
uh, in www.waltaco.com at the very top near the center, there's a tab called important safety information that literally contains all the information that I'm going to be presenting here. So uh, that, I think that will facilitate your note taking or if you need to go back and review it, please feel free to visit um, the website. Um, I think the most important safety uh, information that uh, one should be aware of with Valtoco is that it's a benzodiazepine medication. And taking benzodiazepines with opioid medications, alcohol, or any other medication that suppresses the central nervous system, uh, including street drugs, can cause severe drowsiness, breathing problems such as respiratory depression, which may lead to coma and death. Uh, Valtoco can make you sleepy uh, or dizzy. It can slow your thinking or your motor skills. So be aware of that. So you certainly do not want to drive, uh, do not want to operate heavy machinery, or put yourself in any kind of activity in which if you have an impairment of your thinking or your motor skills may result in negative uh, outcome. Uh, like other anti-epileptic uh, drugs, and this warning is for all anti-epileptic drugs, Valtoco may cause suicidal thoughts. Um, it's a small number, about one in 500, and you should report to your healthcare provider uh, if you have any symptoms such as ones listed below, uh, particularly thoughts about suicide or, suicide or dying, feeling agitas agitation or new worsening of your anxiety, irritability, uh, or depression. Nancy, can we progress to the next slide, please? Now, pay attention to any one of those uh, early signs of your mood. Um, uh, such as, you know, that could, that could actually lead to those suicidal thoughts. Uh, and you should actually report those to your healthcare provider um, or call them in between visits if, you, if, if these actually arise in between visits. Uh, what should you tell your doctor uh, before taking Baltoco? I certainly let them know if you have a history of asthma, emphysema, bronchitis, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or the breathing problems. If you have a history of alcohol or drug abuse for the reasons noted above about the concomitant use of benzodiazepines with opiates, alcohol, and other CNS suppressants. If you have a history of depression, mood problems, or suicidal thoughts or behavior. If you have liver or kidney problems, or if you're pregnant or plan to become pregnant, as Valtoco uh, may harm your unborn baby. If you're breastfeeding or, or plan to breastfeed, Valtoco does passes into your breast milk and may harm your baby. Talk to your healthcare provider about the best way to feed your baby if you're using Baltoco. Um, you definitely have to tell your, your physician or healthcare provider the medications you're taking, including prescriptions and over-the-counter medications, vitamin or herbal supplements, as well as if you're using any uh, street drugs uh, that may be CNS suppressants. Can we progress to the next slide, Nancy? Thank you. So how should you use Baltoco? I think Nancy reviewed a number of this uh, information. I will highlight the information as well. Um, your healthcare provider will let you know what seizure clusters are, uh, exactly how much Baltoco to give based on the, the weight and the age uh, uh, of either yourself or your uh, loved one, uh, ex uh, when to give Baltoco, how to give Baltoco, and what you to do after you give uh, Valtoco, uh, particularly if the seizures do not stop. Nancy mentioned the uh, seizure action plans, which I think is important to discuss with your physician and your uh, nurse practitioner and your nurse uh, at the, what is the seizure action plan that is speci specific, specific for, your, uh, for your condition. Um, make sure that family members, other care providers, and other people that are around you know how to give Valtoco in the event of an emergency. We have some patients that self-administer, but nevertheless, you certainly want to make sure that the medication is, uh, that those around you are going to be able to give Valtoco when you need it. Um, and Valtoco is given only intranasally through the nose. It comes ready to use. Um, it's, you spray it one time. It cannot be reused. Uh, do not test or prime the nasal spray, otherwise you will lose the dose. Uh, it could be given in any direction. Uh, it doesn't matter the position of the head. The device actually works. Uh, in, it has what is called 360 degree functionality. 
So in any head position, it can be given whether the head is laying down or, or, the, or, or one is sitting up. Each dose of Bartoco comes in an individual uh, pack. Use all the medicine in one pack for a complete dose. In the case of the five and 10 milligram dose, as Nancy mentioned, it's, it's one spray per pack. For the 15 and 20 uh, milligrams is two sprayers in the pack, one for each nostril. Thank you, Nancy. Now, what should you do after you give Baltoco? Uh, stay with the person after you give Baltoco and watch them closely. If you use Baltoco, if you self-administer Baltoco because your epilepsy condition allows you to do so, make sure you call and you notify a loved one or someone around you that in fact you did so. Um, keep or move the person onto their side. Uh, in other words, you're gonna follow first aid seizure emergency. Make note of the time the Baltoco was given and call emergency help if any of the following. Seizure behavior is different than any other seizure the person has had, or you are alarmed as the as how often the seizure happened, how severe the seizure was, how long the seizure lasts, or by the color or the breathing of the person. Um, throw away uh, the Baltoco. Uh, as an FYI, the amount of diazepam left in Baltoco is negligible, it's very small, it's not abusable. Um, if you need a second dose, it can be given four hours after the first dose. You will be using an, the new pack of Baltoco, which is essentially the backup dose of that box. Do not give more than two doses of Baltoco to treat a seizure cluster. Um, a second dose should not be given if you're concerned about the person's breathing, uh, if they need help with their breathing or have extreme drowsiness. Please call the provi your provider or emergency services in that, in, in that situation. Do not use Baltoco, as Nancy indicated, for more than one seizure cluster episode every five days. Uh, do not use Baltoco for more than five seizure clusters episodes in one month. For each seizure cluster, you can use a maximum of two doses, as I mentioned. So again, just to summarize, what you should avoid while, take, while taking Baltoco? Do not drink alcohol or take opioid medications, as this can actually enhance the CNS super, uh, depression. Um, what are the most common side effects of Baltoco? Feeling drowsy or sleepy, headache, or the, or the nasal discomfort. Uh, now, there's a lot more of other possible side effects of Baltoco, so please call your healthcare provider for medical advice about side effects. You may report side effects to Norales, at, a, at the toll-free number provided, which is 1-866-696-3873, or to the FDA at 1-800-FDA-1088. Uh, refer to the full prescribing information as well as to the medication guide for additional important safety information and also for the list of the potential side effects of Baltoco. Um, Nancy, I'm gonna pass it on then to Steve, who's gonna talk about the Norales uh, support as in place for patients and care partners. Great, thanks Enrique, appreciate it. Thank you, Nancy. We also have a service uh, through MyNorellis um, and MyNorellis is a program that we have um, that we uh, have in place so that you can call in and get services through nurse educators um, and other support. So the nurse educators themselves, um, Let's say you call in and say, I just want more information on how to use Valtoco. I, I'd like more things on instructions. I'd like to be able to train friends or family. Well, we have nurse educators available through Minorellis that can do one-on-one -on -one training for that. They can do Zoom, over the phone, whatever you need. They have demonstration units to walk you through it. Um, they also can make sure that you can get links to all the instructions for use, which are on our website. They can send those direct and provide them to you. And we have demonstration kits. So we have kits that have been built with um, demonstration units, quick start guides. So please, um, if you have any questions, um, please make sure that you get in touch with them and, and they're happy to help. Um, it's a service that we want to make sure that we put in place. One of the things I also want to touch on before we leave this, because these are our patient services through Max or Minorellis, back to the expiration program, is if you do get an exchange, there's no additional copay. So from a cost perspective, I just want to make sure you know, if you have expired product, let us know. We'll take care of that. Um, but if you have anybody who has a question on how do I use the product, and this goes for multiple uh, groups, whether it's yourself, family members, 
school nurses. Nancy just did a round of uh, programs last week. We had four of them with over a thousand school nurses on. We're there to train. We wanna make sure that people know how to use a nasal spray and be ready to go um, in a seizure emergency for seizure cluster. Next slide. So really just to, as a, a wrap up is, um, you know, we're very excited. Um, like I said, it, it's been a long journey for, for many of us. And uh, it's, a, it's an area that we're very passionate about. Not only I think most of us that have been in it from the pharmaceutical standpoint, but family, friends, I know we, me personally and others, um, uh, this means a lot. So, you know, we are indicated, Valtoco is indicated uh, for seizure clusters, um, six years and older for seizure rescue. And um, it's a medication, diazepam, when heritage meets technology is kind of our thing. Diazepam has been around for a long time. It's used in this space for over 20 years as a um, seizure rescue for acute repetitive seizures or seizure clusters. It's been epilepsy for over 50 years. It's a molecule that's you know been used and um, over time, many, many times. Anyone can administer. Nancy was doing some great visuals um, on you know the size uh, of Valtoco itself, um, but you can carry it with you. It's ready for prompt administration. And the other thing is the dosing. So individualized dosing we felt was important. I know when Craig went through the development of um, Valtoco, it was you know individualized dosing meant a lot with diastat to make sure you had the right dose at the right time for the right patient. Well, Valtoco is the same, you know, so we want to make sure that that individualized piece is there. And that's why getting it biocomparable to diastat was so critical. And not only was it important from that standpoint, we also wanted to be true to pricing. We know cost comes up a lot. Well, it, we do what we do, flat pricing, which is what diastat did. It doesn't matter what dose, the price is the same. Now, what does that mean from a copay standpoint? Obviously, we have programs in place to get it down to $20, but we wanted to make sure even on the provider side, whether it's insurance companies, it's flat price. It wasn't gonna creep because you have a higher dose, you, there's a higher price to it, it's flat. Um, and that was important to all of us and I think speaks to the, the culture of the company and what we're all about, which I'm happy to be a part of. Um, you know, it's, it's a small discrete nasal spray, which I know is very, very important in the space considering how many years we've all been waiting for something else. Um, and not only that, it's diazepam as a molecule, I said it's the heritage, but you know, it works quickly and it lasts. That's why diazepam has, has been here for such an extended period of time. So well thought of. So I, I know that I'm the marketing guy and I, I tend to get a little excited about this, but again, it's a, it's a very um, passionate place for me and I, I'm thankful to be a part of it. So appreciate everybody for letting us be on today. I think we may have something in the Q and A um, and I'll bring that forward here just in a second uh, and then we'll close it out. So, Question, and, and Enrique, this may go over to you. Um, can Valtoco be used in conjunction with other rescue meds? For example, if the alternate does not work, can you then try Valtoco as a second resort? Um, there's not been a study whether you could, uh, whether you could use more than one rescue medication. Uh, my advice will be not to, since you know, you're basically using the same um, class of drug uh, and you are amplifying the side effects of that class of drug. So both midazolam uh, and diazepam have CNS uh, depressant effects. Uh, midazolam's respiratory depression is more concerning as per their label. Um, and therefore using one on top of the other may actually be uh, counterproductive from a safety perspective. I think if a person continues to seize, uh, one should call uh, your healthcare provider uh, for instructions. Uh, the seizure action plan may have those instructions already, so it's good to pre-discuss them. Uh, and some patients may uh, require the emergency services uh, to be called. Excellent. Thank you. We had one other question come through, and it was, uh, maybe this might go to Craig or Chuck, is uh, product availability in Canada yeah, no, I'm happy to answer that. No, it's uh, not, not currently available in Canada. Um, we are uh, looking at potential options to make it available in Canada, but uh, not, not in the immediate future. Mm -hmm. But we are actively looking, like Craig said, as always, so appreciate that. Um, that is all the questions came through. Um, so what I will do is want to say thank you to everybody for presenting um, from our group but more so thank you for everyone from the, the LGS community. It's, it's so good to see 
some familiar folks like uh, Jennifer and also names like Tracy. Tracy gets to see your name pop up. Um, and with that, Jennifer, I will pass it back to you to, to close things out. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Steve. And thanks to all of our panelists and to everybody who attended today. Um, we hope to see you again tomorrow for another town hall meeting. And you can learn about that and view recordings of past webinars on the LGS Foundation website's uh, webinar page. So enjoy the rest of your day. And again, thank you to everybody from Norellis. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Oh, I guess. Thank you.